In this video, we're gonna be talking about the home lab, the concept of a home lab. And I got Josh here. You can check his channel out. I'll put that down in the description below. And uh, he'll also have his own version of this nice video over on his channel. So definitely go check it out. Let's get started. I guess we could start off this conversation by saying also this comes from a live stream over on YouTube. So you can come over and see the full live stream. It's this is we're literally recording this as part of a GIMP like masterclass live stream on my channel. So uh, we made a th the thumbnail that's going up on my channel. Maybe Josh will use it on his. I don't know. Doesn't really matter. Maybe he'll replace my picture in my thumbnail with his. That'll be pretty cool. But <laughs> so we we decided as home lab being home lab explained being the topic of it. So Josh, I think you're probably the best person to explain in detail what a home lab is. What is a home lab? Well, technically, the definition of home lab is actually a relatively new concept, only only fairly recent in the past couple years. It's been, uh, the more traditional name for it is just a home server, which is basically just like you having a server at your home. Uh, but the idea of a home lab is actually not necessarily like the home server, but more of just like a a uh, server that you have access to that you're willing to play around with because for one thing it's at your home and because you're experimenting with it it's a lab uh, generally that's that's how it what it is so if you go to youtube and you type in like hashtag home lab there's a few youtubers that do videos of, of, about home labs and they're oftentimes uh going going down the rabbit hole of, of uh messing around with stuff like virtual machines, do Docker containers, and so on. But really, you don't have to do all of that because generally, like, the number one thing that most people would have and set up for, like, a home lab is more of, like, a network-attached storage or NAS. Yeah. And uh, it, it's literally just a bunch of disks that operate a file share. <laughs> well, I mean, That's... I I know of quite a few people that that perfectly describes their home lab setup. It is literally just a storage device they have that they share yeah, on all their and, devices. And it might just happen to run Plex too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I mean, Proxmox, like, you know, there's a whole bunch of different tools that you'll hear people bring up in a discussion about a home lab. The easiest way to explain those conversations is like when you're hearing someone talk about server stuff or you know, programs for their servers. Normally what those, like almost all of the programs, if you're unfamiliar with them, normally come down to like one of two things. It's media sharing. That That's normally what is some form of media sharing or like a, a local, so, sometimes it's a transfer system, like transferring files and syncing files between systems. Those are normally the programs that you'll hear brought up the most often, most often when it comes into home lab discussion. Do you use Plex at your home, Josh? I don't use Plex itself. I use a, I use something like it called a Jellyfin, which is basically just like Plex, but it's free and open source. I've actually been considering, because I do use Plex here, not like it's not something that we mainly use on our devices but we do have like i do have plex set up we could use it everywhere it's just you know yeah. i got a i got a mom and sister who stay at the house quite frequently and you know they like netflix and they don't want to do anything else so i have been considering going to jellyfin but i haven't been pushed off of plex now to where like i feel like i need to yet I haven't had that drive. I mean, honestly, like if you're using Plex and you're like dealing with all like the streaming or the Federation aspects of Plex where like you can connect to other secondary Plex servers, there's really not much reason to go with Jellyfin because Jellyfin works be best with just like your local content. There there are plugins and stuff that you can get for it to, to access all the streaming, but uh, I'd like to delve a little bit more into like what the purposes of like the lab aspect of a home home lab would be, because uh, generally what we're talking about is just general general like NAS stuff, and then what Jell what Plex and Jellyfin are, they, those are media streaming servers that you can set up and host on your home lab. But the idea of the home lab is really just like a learn so a uh, learning tool that you can use. Generally, what the home lab is supposed to be is is like I said, a 
learning tool. And it's also a great way to build practical experience if you're looking to get into a career of system administration or even cl cloud networking. So if you're looking to be like an administrator, you can take your experiences with a home lab, depending on how you set it up, of course. And you and it's almost a one to one transition between what you're running at your house to what you're dealing with at your job. So uh, when people are talking about like, uh, you know, using Proxmox, Proxmox actually does have a an enterprise user base. Is it massive? Not necessarily, not compared to like Red Hat or, uh, you know, like CentOS. So you're probably not going to be like working at Amazon, working with Proxmox, but you might be at like Rackspace or Unohost because they use Proxmox. The skills that you'll learn using those tools are transferable. And and also I think a big a big point with with getting a home lab set up at home is if you if you if you have a place to experiment and play around with tools that are not necessarily going to be used in your specific job, but definitely in your field, you'll be more knowledgeable and more ahead of people who are going to school like you most likely are anyway going to be going to school for it because at home you're already doing more than the people who are just going to school and just do, taking classes and doing what they have to to pass and you know hopefully yep. get a job like your your set of knowledge will be much wider and also your ability to adapt to new software will be much higher and i think think that's the most important thing with any type of sysadmin job adapt like adapting is the biggest thing that you need to be able to do i mean it honestly it i am a business owner because i own and operate a business i i right now i don't actually have like the computer guy at work right because my company's small but if i was a higher computer guy and he walked up to me and he's just like yeah i got all these certifications and and i look at that that age field right there on the application it says that he's only 22 years old did he did, does he actually know what he's talking about or did he just go through like a computer science course at the university that just so happened to like cover some of these tools that he's talking about that that uh, he's knowledgeable in what what i want is the practical experience and honestly the computer industry is very weird in that you don't need the college degree technically you might not even need the certification to get the job yeah. you just have to be willing that you know what you're doing and honestly, if you have a home lab where you set up a Samba share and you're applying for a job and they pull you in for the interview, copy the Samba configuration file to a USB drive and take it in there and show them. This is the Samba configuration I wrote. This is the network. This is the NFS share. This is how I deployed all my user, user groups, file permissions and all that. And it's like I would be way more impressed and, and you would be much more hireable than than anybody else so far. Yeah. <laughs> And that's kind of the biggest thing with getting jobs in the tech field, even though the job, like, cause I, I've seen this a lot. Cause this is what a lot of people complain about. The jobs will ask for like, you know, not necessarily a ridiculous amount of education, but normally for a lot of it. And you'll find people in those jobs, those exact positions with none of the things that the actual like application asks for. And that's because yep. if you go into an interview and you can sit down with someone and talk for 15 minutes or be the person smart enough to bring in something that people don't normally bring into an interview that can show off what you can do, you're probably going to get the job over everyone else who does have a degree or whatever, because they're only willing to do exactly what is asked of them to get the job done. Like that, that's a big thing in interviews. And yep. I think a, I think a home lab is probably one of the best ways to get general knowledge for those kind of situations. You'll end up experiencing related topics. Like e e even if you're not like, let's say you're not doing anything specifically with like SQL and databases, but if you're using a home lab and you're over time, you're going to end up using something that relies on SQL light or something, you'll end up getting familiar with a touch of something that you wouldn't otherwise get into especially if sqlite does that wonderful thing where sqlite does and 
it updates and then the update is a breaking update and then you have to figure out how to troubleshoot SQLite which there's basically next to no documentation on good luck have fun because <laughs> <laughs> you know SQLite is one of those things where you deploy it and then even the SQLite developers say you should probably never update this by the way no. <laughs> that's often why SQLite is actually embedded in the application <laughs> that's also a good thing to to talk about because another benefit of ha having a home lab is you will find the pieces of software that are ubiquitous in the space that have poor documentation and that is a really good thing to find out because if if you can find something that has poor documentation and find out how to fix problems that occur when using it getting a job can be way easier because anybody that relies on something that needs it, you're an asset they need. Just reading this book alone, SE Linux System Administration, <laughs> got me a pretty juicy contract with a bank with a bank uh, redeployment one time. <laughs> oh, I mean, it, like that's kind of the thing. Like to have a home lab, it doesn't require that you have a big, expensive like PC, a network of PCs. Because like when you search oh, no. home lab on YouTube, like you will see some crazy videos with people like you know, yeah, like wild setups, and you don't need that. Like you can start uh, off with a yeah. home lab being literally a netbook with some hard drives plugged into it. That could be your starting point. Yeah, not not everybody's craft computing where he where he's got like four 42U server racks running that are fully loaded loaded with machines and JBODs. Not everybody's <laughs> going to not everybody's going to have something like that. I myself, I only have I do have the server rack, but but I've only got like four running systems on it. And uh honestly, my general big server that I just call lab because it is the primary server that I mess around with stuff on, mm -hmm. uh, that is actually my old gaming computer. <laughs> <laughs> like just straight up my old gaming computer because you know, it's a great way to recycle that because when mm -hmm. you build a desktop gaming system, it's relatively powerful, might not have the world's greatest CPU, but at the same time, if you're just playing video games, you're not making use of every single feature that that CPU is, that, that CPU is capable of. All, almost every higher tier CPU at this point supports virtualization, which, you know, w when you're dealing with a home lab, you're going to be, you might be using quite a bit of virtualization. You might not be doing it on your gaming computer, but now you have a new purpose for that processor when you're not using it anymore. The only thing that's sort of not transferable is like your desktop gaming GPU. Uh, yes, uh, you can do stuff like transcoding with it too, but generally, I actually don't use a gpu in my servers yeah <laughs> but so, that's also because you know i don't transcode at all <laughs> <laughs> generally you don't even need like a relatively powerful system either you can uh you can use an old potato computer like my very first home lab of what and this was like 2009 when i first started around started around with it because and at that time the term home lab didn't exist it was more like just self-hosting or and uh like even nas's weren't like commonplace in like the home environment but you so like the purpose-built nas devices like we have today they weren't as ubiquitous ubiquitous back then uh yes we did have stuff like a uh, free nas that that was around uh free nas and open media vault actually was open media vault i think open media vault was around was still relatively brand new back then but Yes, that, that did exist, but it was, I think it was an e-machine computer, and it was 32-bit, and uh, that was my very first home lab computer. It had the wonderful 250 gig hard drive for, like, the root file system, and then to get more drives for it, I went to more yard sales, and I bought more computers so I can get more hard drives out of them, because every computer had at least one hard drive in it at the time. Yeah. We didn't have, and we didn't have embedded SSDs or anything like that on, on our boards. And, uh, you know, buying the used computer was actually cheaper than buying the brand new hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to get like super expensive with it. And that e-machine had like a Pentium 4 CPU of some kind. I actually don't know the model number because I just didn't care. <laughs> well, I think that's a big thing to keep in mind when you go for your first home lab. You don't have to start out with something with a powerful processor, like at all. Like at all, no. at, at all. I, I mean, you're like, I, I would be very surprised if on this video or our videos, we don't get a ton of people telling us that, yeah, I started out on a Raspberry Pi. Like that was my 
that was my home lab first. Like that's where I started. Yeah. Ras- that's honestly what the Raspberry Pi was sort of intended for. Mm-hmm. Uh, lighted, it was it was basically just like purpose built and intended for like uh, learning programming. But, you know, it very quickly like gained the new purpose of, hey, let's spin up like cheap servers. <laughs> yeah. Just like a quick buying guide as to what you're doing. Uh, when we say that you don't need a whole lot of whole lot of computer, that's basically just for like basic file storage. Uh, obviously, you're not going to be running virtual machines on a Raspberry Pi. Yes, it can do it. It's not a good idea. Yeah, but honestly, if you're going to be delving into this field, just start with the basic file share, because that's probably the primary reason you're, reason you're going to be using it for to initially start with. Yeah. Uh, and then after you get that set up, just start to think about what you actually wanted to do. Uh, yes, we, we mentioned Plex earlier. Plex is a great way to make use of all those movie files that you just dumped on your dumped on your NAS. It, it's a great way to do to deal with that. Uh, now, other services that you could look into, like, you know, a self-hosted Git repository server. That way you don't have to. That way, you know, you can keep all of your private configuration files in a Git repository. That because because you probably shouldn't be posting like private keys to a GitHub or GitLab. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you you probably do want to back up those files too. Like not everyone yeah. does that, but you once you start doing that, life does get much simpler. It it, it does start get, getting simpler, and you know when you blow up your debt, and if you're like me and you blow up like your your well like. Today, before we recorded, I updated Void Linux and it just decided I didn't need a kernel anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, if I blow up my desktop's uh, computer, uh, I can just reinstall and then I can just pull my backup from from my server and it's 15 minutes. I have it, I have a fresh installed distro with all my files. <laughs> and it's like, how long does that take to re-download every, download everything back from Google Drive? That's going to take, like, hours. So uh, you can do the backups that... That's part of the file share, but uh, you can also just like go down like the networking rabbit hole of like figuring out like how to how to create your own DHCP server because you can do that with Linux. Uh, self-hosting DNS, uh, you know, you you can use like uh, for DHCP server, DHCP CD can actually do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might have just installed it and then just started like the systemd service for it before, but. Have you ever looked at the DHCP CD configuration file and see all those commented out options for the DHCP server? And you want to do some firewall rules too? Did you know that UFW can actually set up set a port pass through to devices on that the DHCP server is actually uh, utilizing? And now you're going down the rabbit hole of just like this is way more complicated than my cheap cheap twenty dollar TP Link router. But man, this is interesting because you know that's enterprise stuff that you're messing with right there. By the way, <laughs> well, and that's that, that's the fun part. Like the fun part is knowing that you're doing something that, like, is a career level hobby. Like you're you're getting into something that not only can be fun to mess around with, but can also one day get you paid. And that that's the yeah, that's kind of the most awesome part about a home lab. Yeah, generally the the your home lab experience is not going to like translate one to one to like the enterprise space. I'm just I'm just going to make this clear for you right now. But you know like that small business contractor, you know like those IT groups that contract out like their services to other small businesses and they're like that small business's IT team. Mm-hmm. That's generally the kind that's generally the kind of place that's going to want to hire you the most because then they don't have to train you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys all for watching. This has been a lot of fun, this conversation. Thank you, Josh, for, you know, meeting with me, having this conversation. It's a lot of fun. Not a problem. So I'll be putting up on the screen now, all the people who support me over on Patreon. Thank you guys. This all wouldn't be possible if people didn't support me. Cause you know, YouTube don't, don't pay stuff. And I spend a lot of extra time on this. So I got to have some drive to do it. So thank you guys. It means a lot. And also, thank you everyone for doing the normal YouTube stuff, the like and subscribing, you know, thank you. It helps a ton, you know, for, you know, the day that YouTube starts paying a decent amount per view, but whatever <laughs> we can hope. Thank you guys uh, for watching. That's only going to go down the more people watch YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But still, <laughs> one can hope. <laughs> so thanks guys for watching and I'll see you. Well, actually, I and Josh will see you in the next one. See ya. See ya.